הזמן הוא אויבי הגדול ביותר.
chapter 9, we read, For a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. There will be no end to the increase of his government or of peace on the throne of David and over his kingdom to establish it and uphold it with justice and righteousness from then on and forevermore the zeal of the Lord of armies will accomplish this amen that is why we are gathered right now we don't gather for a tradition or a feeling of Christmas we gather to celebrate King Jesus the King of Kings the everlasting Father the mighty God so we're gonna sing his name together today and we're gonna worship him Let's sing together. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, Emmanuel, God with us, is here with me. Wonderful Counselor, the government is resting on His shoulders.
Christmas. It's so good to see you. We're so glad you're here spending part of your Christmas season with us. We don't take that lightly, seriously. Hey, before we go any further, why don't you make this place feel like home? Turn around, say Merry Christmas to someone, maybe high five if you feel like it. Tell them your favorite Christmas movie, whatever that looks like, and you guys can find your seat. Well, Merry Christmas to everyone. So glad to uh, have you uh, join us today. And, uh, you know, over the last several weeks, uh, you have likely uh, put a lot of time, thought, and energy into getting just the perfect gifts for the people that you love. And the reason why we do that isn't just to give somebody um, something that we purchased, but it's to convey a message behind the gift that we give, to say to these people in our lives, like, this is how much... I care about you, this is how much you mean to me. And we all know that the gifts that we give and receive this year at Christmas, like it, they have a timeline, like eventually uh, they're gonna end up in the storage closet or the box marked Goodwill, like not all, but, but most of these gifts, that's where they're going. Like the electronics that we give, they will eventually become obsolete. The clothes we give will eventually go out of style. The, Fruitcake we give will immediately be discarded. I mean, and, I mean, and if, by the way, like if you're still giving fruitcake, can I just speak as your pastor? Like, like you need to stop, all right? Like just, just stop doing that. Like nobody wants that. And um, we're usually okay with the fact that like gifts aren't going to last forever because I don't know who said it or when they said it, but we've all kind of latched on to this phrase. Like it's not the gift, but it's the... It's a thought that counts. But, you know, we know that that isn't even always the case. There was a guy uh, several years ago by the name of Carl Hurley who was talking about how he asked his wife several weeks before Christmas what her finger size was. And she got all excited. And later he was out with his friends. He was like, man, I don't know why she got that excited. I'm like just getting her a bowling ball. <laughs> and, you know, sometimes, sometimes the gifts that we receive aren't always what we were expecting, but oftentimes it's the gift that we needed. My favorite passage that conveys the Christmas story is found in Luke 2. And my favorite verse within my favorite passage is verse 11. I want to read it to you. It simply says this, For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And I just want to draw your attention to these two little words, unto you. Uh, unto you. I think that means this, this is a gift that was meant just for you. And the gift answers the question, well, how much would God spend to show or to demonstrate his love for you? What kind of gift would it require for God to communicate just how much value you have to him? And Christmas answers that question. I was born in uh, 1976, which means that I'm uh, a 70s baby, but the 80s made me. And uh, man, there's so much about the 80s that I loved. So many iconic things about it, including like Michael Jackson's Thriller video, uh, Big Bang's Parachute Pants, like the, the whole deal. But maybe none more iconic than uh, this gentleman uh, right here, uh, the goat himself, Michael Jordan. Now, I'm, I'm just kind of curious because uh, uh, in last night's service, I ran a little poll because I just want to see what kind of church I'm pastoring. <laughs> and so uh, how many of you, just a round of applause at all of our campuses, wherever you're joining us, how many of you would say that LeBron James is the greatest of all time? Just curious. <laughs> kind of pathetic, really. <laughs> now, how many of you would say that MJ is the greatest of all time? All right. There we go. There we go. I'm confident God is going to say, well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> uh, you know, man, Michael Jordan was like my idol growing up, like uh, through the 80s and into the 90s. And uh, I remember when the Air Jordans 
first came out. Like I was in grade school, I begged my mom for a pair. They were $65, can you imagine? And my mom was like, no way, we're not spending 60 bucks on a pair of shoes. And so I never did get them. And then several years ago, I took my mom to New York City and we went into the, one of those high-end sneaker stores. You know, the ones where the shoes are wrapped in saran wrap? And uh, they had the vintage Air Jordan 1s in there. And so I pointed them out to my mom and I said, mom, do you recognize those? She's like, no. And I said, those are the first Air Jordans. I begged you for those when I was in grade school. You wouldn't buy them for me because they were $65. And uh, she goes, oh, she goes, well, that breaks my heart. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I broke mine too. And, uh, and she, then she said this, she goes, uh, I'll get them for you now. <laughs> and I was like, mom, go look at the price tag. And so she walks over there, looks at the price tag, her eyes get as big as saucers. And she comes over and she goes, well, you know, that, that is a lot. Uh, do they have a layaway? <laughs> I love my mom so much. All right, so, um, but one of the things that I did have was I, I collected a bunch of Michael Jordan basketball cards. And actually when uh, the miniseries, The Last Dance came out, like right when the pandemic started, like I ate all that up. And, and so I, I went down in the basement, pulled out some old shoe boxes and pulled out all my old Michael Jordan cards and just to see how much they'd gone up in value. Now, his 1986-87 Fleer rookie card um, uh, has gone up tremendously in value. In fact, I want to show you, uh, this is like a wide range. I think the, uh, the highest that this has sold for at auction was like $800,000. Um, I did have this card in my possession briefly when I was in middle school and I traded it away, one of the worst decisions of my life. If any of you want to give your pastor a Christmas gift. All right, so, but, but one of the things I just want to point out is I just wanted to show you the wide variety of values on the same card. Like you've got over here like 500,000 and you got over here like, you know, 7,499, 39.95 right here. And see, the thing is, is that it's just cardboard and ink. Like in and of itself, it's just worth a few cents. But its value is not determined by what it is. Its value is determined by what somebody is willing to pay for it. And so when the angel says in Luke 2, Unto you is born this day a savior. That's God's way of saying, here's the price that I'm willing to pay for you. Like your worth is not determined by your past. It's not determined by what you believe or what you think. Your worth is not determined by your performance or what you achieve. Your worth was declared 2,000 years ago when God sent, here's, here's the gift that I have sent to show how much you are worth to me. And I don't know if you've received that or accepted it or believe it, but I want to declare it again today. And I, I don't know, you know, I don't know what kind of crowd we got here in this service. Like maybe you're here right now and, and you're, uh, if you're being honest, you're a little uncomfortable. Like this, like the most people you've been around in like two years. And you kind of like look around and you're like, man, I'm not really all that much of a religious person. I, I don't know that I believe in God. Well, I kind of believe, believe in God, but like it's complicated. And honestly, you were to say right now, like I am just here in this service to keep the peace with someone in the family. That's why I'm here. And I just want you to know that I'm so glad that you are here. And I want to say the truth, even though you may not yet come to believe the truth, but I think there's power in hearing it is that God sent his son Jesus to demonstrate how valuable you are to him. And there may be others of you that are there may be others of you that uh, are uncomfortable for a different set of reasons. Like you're like, no, no, no. Like I, I do believe in God. I just don't know if God likes me. And it's been a while since I've been in church and there's a good reason for that. Like I, I've made some really destructive decisions in my personal life. And the last two years have been really, really hard and I've derailed myself in a, in a number of ways and the anger at the best of me and my addictions came raging back and honestly, uh, in the last 12 months, I did something to really, really mess up my marriage beyond repair. And I just don't know that uh, God wants me here. I don't know that if others knew who I was, that they would want me here. And I just want to say to you that we are all in just as much need of God's grace as anyone else. Without God's grace, we're all hopeless and helpless and we need it so desperately. See, Christmas is the ultimate reminder that you are worth Jesus to God. That's why he sent him to us. And I love how the Gospel of John says it. Jesus is the propitiation for our sins. And that word propitiation just simply means a payment that satisfies. 
Uh, now, if I could maybe explain that a little bit more, I would say that what that means is that God ran the Carfax on you and me, and we came back, broke down, lemon, rebuilt title, and he paid the full price for us anyway. That's what he did because he loves you that much. Now, th there may be another set of people that are here right now, and you're not uncomfortable. In fact, uh, you're actually a little bit um, too comfortable because uh, you're here all the time and you believe all this stuff and you're like, oh, Aaron, I, I've heard a bunch of sermons. Like, I know where you're going with this. Tell him, Aaron, tell him. And I just want to very gently but very directly remind you that Jesus would lay down his life for rebellious people, but it was religious people who would kill him. And that our morality doesn't do us necessarily any good. Like your morality, like your good morals might earn you a good reputation externally and it, it might keep you out of jail, but it's gonna require the blood of Jesus to get you into heaven. And that first Christmas, the gift didn't go under the tree. The gift would go eventually onto a tree. And Jesus was laid in a cradle made of wood so that one day he would be nailed to a cross of wood. And he did that to remove the penalty of our sins and then supply his presence. Which explains Matthew's gospel. When he says the virgin will conceive and they will call his name Emmanuel. And we sang about it earlier. It just simply means God is with us. And that is the essence of the Christmas story that maybe so many of us have forgotten. And maybe here over the last several weeks, you've just said it, you've heard it, you've thought it to yourself. It just doesn't feel much like Christmas right now. I mean, with everything going on in the news and just all the anxiety and all the division, it just doesn't quite feel like Christmas. And I would say it feels more like the first Christmas, maybe more than ever, because that first Christmas, things were really, really dark in the world. And God demonstrated that he is for us and with us. He's not distant. He's not set back. He wrapped Jesus in human flesh and he sent him right into the middle of the darkness of this world to send a message that even when things are at its darkest, God is with us. And right now, you take like the pandemic and all the political division kind of out of it and just kind of focus on your own personal life. Maybe you would kind of go, man, this was a really, really hard year aside from all that other stuff. Because maybe in the last 12 months for you, this was the year that the cancer returned. This was the year that your marriage fell apart. This was the year that somebody that you were really, really close to, they walked out of your life and you're not exactly sure why. This is the year that your job was eliminated. This was the year that you were falsely accused and now your reputation has been ruined. This was the year that the anxiety disrupted you and the depression pinned you down. And so you hear a message like God is with you and you're like, man, it doesn't feel like he's with me. That's how it always feels when it's dark. That's how it always feels when you go through trial and difficulty. You feel alone. And I've definitely had those moments when I feel alone, even recently. What I will tell you from experience is that when I'm in the present moment, looking out the windshield of my life, so to speak, it's oftentimes very difficult to discern God's presence with me. It's when I take the time to look back and I look in the rearview mirror, I can begin to see God's presence and his faithfulness much more clearly when I look back. You know, when I was growing up, uh, I wasn't very good with, with girls and I would develop these crushes and I'd work up the nerve to talk to them and maybe get a date or two and then I'd just mess it all up, you know? And, and they would, uh, you know, eventually break my heart and leave and, and I would always like just, my prayer life would increase every time and I would just cry out to God, like, God, where are you? 20, 30 years later, see the same girl and I'm, whoa, God, you were with me. <laughs> you really were. As, as the words of the great theologian Garth Brooks once said, sometimes God's greatest gifts are unanswered prayers. Yeah, amen. <laughs> and you know, I can tease and, and joke about that. And yet on a much more serious note, like even in the really, really difficult times, I'm reminded that God is with us. I know the last two years have been difficult for everybody. Uh, probably the most difficult for me was June of 2020. That was like the, the worst of the worst, the lowest of the low. 
And at that particular time, like, you know, we weren't able to gather in crowds. Like I missed people. We couldn't have church on Sunday morning. And aside to all that, like it seemed like uh, every decision that I made, uh, it, it made like, at least half of the people upset. It didn't matter what it was. It, it seemed like uh, if I opened my mouth and said something, I got criticized. If I didn't say something, I got criticized and we couldn't gather and it was just rough. And I, what you need to understand about me, especially if like this is our first time meeting is that, man, I love what I do. Like I love being um, not just a pastor. I love being your pastor. Like there isn't any other church that I want to pastor. Like this is my dream job. This is like what I want to do forever. This is what I feel like God's put me on the planet to do. And yet in June of 2020, I wanted to quit. I wanted to walk away. And there was one particular Sunday morning, I was in my basement, which is where I usually was on Sunday morning when we couldn't gather, just grieving. And I remember I pulled out my phone and I was looking for some mutual encouragement, you know, misery loves company. And so I texted a good friend of mine and who pastors a church similar in size, just in another state. And, and uh, here's how I started it. I said, hey man, how you doing? And I was hoping he would say, man, I'm really going through a rough time. And I'm like, yeah, me too. We could kind of mutually encourage each other, but oh no. Instead, he texts back and he, he texts me a picture. He's playing with his girls uh, on some like of their playground equipment. He's got his cup of coffee and he says, I'm having a really great morning with my girls. And then he said this, he goes, I'm just really enjoying this season. And I was like, nee, 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 nee. <laughs> you're not my friend anymore. And I remember crying out, God, where are you? Now, a year and a half later, uh, I can't exactly tell you um, when I came out of that dark place. I can't tell you when. I, I just know I'm not in it anymore. But here's what, I, here's what I know is that God didn't get me out of it. He got me through it because he was with me in it. That's Emmanuel. And I want you to know that that, that, that is the message of Christmas, that you are worth Jesus to God and Jesus came to be with you. It reminds me of the grandfather who goes over to visit his uh, two-year-old uh, grandson and uh, he walks in the door and his daughter, uh, the, grand, the little boy's mom, is at the kitchen sink. She's doing some stuff and she turns around. And she says, Dad, you can't go in and see him yet. He's, he's in trouble. He's in a timeout in his room in his pack and play. Just, you just need to wait. And that was just like, he did not want to hear that. That's why he went over to, to, was to see his grandson. And so he uh, kept walking by his grandson's room and the little boy's in there in the pack and play, big crocodile tears. His lips are quivering. He's holding up his arms for Papa. And man, he just couldn't stand it. His, his daughter's still in the kitchen and things get really, really quiet. And so she wonders what's going on. And so she goes down the hallway. She peers her head inside of her son's room. And there she sees her dad has climbed into the pack and play. <laughs> Didn't pull him out. He went in with. And that is the message of Christmas. Emmanuel. God is with us. So the only question left, and this is meant for you, not for your neighbor, not for your friend, it's for you. Are you with him? See, it doesn't really matter if Jesus was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago if he hasn't been born into your heart today. That is the greatest gift that you can receive. And so I want to acknowledge that uh, this message probably hasn't resolved everything for you. It's probably not answered all of your questions. Maybe it's not answered any of your questions. But if you are today by faith ready to receive that gift, what I want to ask you to do, wherever you're joining us from, bow your head, close your eyes, and just let me lead you through this prayer. Pray it from a sincere heart. God, I know I'm a sinner and have lived for other things first over you. But I believe that you were born into a sinful world to take on the penalty of sin. And so I'm asking that you would take mine too. I believe that you defeated death. And from this day forward, to the best of my ability, I will live for you first. I receive the gift of your grace. Thank you for adopting me into your family as son or daughter in Jesus' name. Amen. Hey Amen. If you... If you received that, if you prayed that, if you claimed that, we just want to come around you. We want to celebrate you. And I want to ask you, and I want to ask you just to simply make that decision known. Just tap the person next to you, uh, call somebody, text somebody on your way out, reach out to one of us, say, hey, I prayed that prayer, and we would love to just kind of help you along in your next steps. 
You know, one survey that was done with Americans uh, several years ago, they said, hey, what are, the, what are the top three things that you most want to hear? What phrases do you want to hear? Here, here was number one, the phrase, I love you. Number two was, I forgive you. Number three was, dinner's ready. <laughs> and I just want you to know that you were loved by God. Look at me, you are forgiven and dinner's ready. There is a seat at the table for you. You know, in, um, I love the way that the Gospel of John uh, begins as he describes um, the announcement of Jesus' birth. And he says this in chapter one, verse nine. He says, the, the true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. And later on in chapter eight, he says, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. This is my favorite time in our Christmas services where we do the candle lighting because it represents the light of the world that came into the world in a really, really dark time. The tradition of Christmas lights actually came out of the 17th century in Germany where they actually lit candles and hung them in trees. <laughs> Sounds like a fire hazard to me. <laughs> but that's where we got the tradition and that's what we're going to do next. And as we do this and as we sing some carols, I want this verse out of Isaiah to just reverberate through your mind and heart. The people who walk in darkness, that's us, will see a great light. That's Jesus. For those who live in a land of deep darkness, that's us, a light will shine. That's Jesus. And so at this time, I want to invite you to stand to your feet and we're going to begin lighting these candles. It's going to go from one person to the next and eventually you'll see the entire room lit up with these candles, symbolizing the light of the world that has come into our lives that's spread across the world as we sing carols together. Thank you. 
Say 